This morning, I would like to talk about what I think may be God's most attractive characteristic and also maybe God's most ignored characteristic. I don't know what you think about when you have a concept or an understanding of God, but A.W. Tozer once said that a person's thoughts of God are actually what end up turning out what their destiny in life is. Whatever you think is the greatest or the most glorious thing will be the thing that your heart is drawn to and that you will pursue. So I think of God's love, I think of God's power, I think of God's righteousness, his justice, his goodness, his kindness, his gentleness, but I rarely ever think about what probably is his most glorious characteristic, and that is his humility. Without God's humility, there is no question, where are you, Adam? Without God's humility, there is no working with people like Gideon or Moses or Ruth or Esther. Without humility, there is no incarnation in a virgin's womb. Without humility, there is no cross. Without the cross, there is no salvation. Without God's humility, there is no restoration of the relationship between fallen humanity and God himself. Because God humbled himself and allowed himself to be humiliated at the cross so that he could buy back you and I into his family. I'd like to talk about this morning, what, well, what was really the humiliation of our great God? Why was it necessary? And then finally, some steps maybe you should take as a result of understanding who your God is. So let's talk about the what of God's humiliation. He was hailed as the king of the Jews, but our text says before they brought him into the palace to mock him as a king, he was scourged. Pilate had him scourged. To the discerning Roman reader who this gospel was written to, they would have wondered why Pilate had Jesus whipped. He was whipped for peace. He was paraded around in purple for play by the soldiers. He was profaned by the priests. He was put down by the passerbyers. And finally, he was in a disgusting way by the most vilest of sinners made fun of, even by those who were crucified with him. But why would a Roman recognize that scourging would have been unusual. Because when the Romans crucified people, they wanted them to suffer as long as they could. And whipping them like they whipped people with cat of nine tails with bits of stone and bone in it to rip the flesh open and expose even sometimes the bones on their back would delay, or, or excuse me, would, would accelerate their death. When the Romans crucified people, they wanted to last them, keep them uh, on the cross as long as they could. Often it took up to four days to die while hanging on a cross. Exposed to the elements, exposed to insects. You ever had an itch on your ear? Could you imagine your hands nailed to a cross and wanting to itch your ear? Or to have some blood on you and have the insects find you? and insects swarming all over you, exposed to the sun by day and the cold at night, sitting on your haunches trying to press up because your chest is constricted and you can't breathe, and so you would drop down and not be able to take a breath, and then just muster enough strength to push yourself up and take a breath and then breathe, only to go through that cycle, agonizingly pushing your bones and your sinew against iron spikes that are holding you down. So the Romans knew that he wasn't scourged. So why did Pilate have Jesus scourged? Because Pilate thought Jesus was innocent. He didn't want to crucify him, so he had him scourged. 
hoping that would satisfy the crowd. But the crowd's bloodlust was so strong that they demanded that he be crucified. So after having him scourged, Pilate handed him over to the soldiers and the whole cohort gathered together. It's probably not the Romans who crucified him that mocked him. It was probably Herod's men. King Herod, for a long time, had wanted a meeting with Jesus and finally got his meeting with Jesus. The other gospel accounts record for us that when Pilate saw that he was from Galilee, he sent him to be with Herod so he could avoid making the judgment. And he lived under Herod's jurisdiction. He was born under Herod's jurisdiction in, well, he was from Nazareth, but born in Bethlehem. And so Pilate thought he could avoid making the decision by sending it to someone else. But Herod, after mocking Jesus, sent him back, saying, he's in Jerusalem, Pilate, you have to decide. But while he was with Herod's men, they stripped him of his clothes and they put a purple robe on him, purple, the royal color, mocking him as king, twisting thorns and cramming them on his head hailing him as king of the Jews, which he was the king of the Jews. He is the king of the Jews, which makes him the king of the whole earth. So as they're humiliating Jesus, stripping him, hailing him as king, he stands there in humility and he takes it. So what's a good definition of humility? A good definition of humility is desiring to serve and put others first without expecting anything in return. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility, I'm sure you've heard this before, is thinking of yourself less. You may be a great person. You may be an amazing person. Pretending that you're not is not humility. If God made you to be amazing, then you should be willing to admit, I'm an amazing person. But in that admission, you can at the same time put other people first. Who was greater that ever walked on the earth than Jesus of Nazareth? No one. Jesus of Nazareth, the perfect human being, knew of his own greatness, he told the high priest, you will see me coming in the clouds of glory, seated at the right hand of Father. That is my rightful position. He's humble when he says that because what he's going to do with all of his power and all of his resources is redeem fallen mankind. He's not going to put himself first and say, I deserve to be on the throne. He's going to act as a servant, even to the point of death, and not only death, but death on a cross. He's going to allow himself to be annihilated so that we can have salvation. This is true humility. We know from the sermon that Bill Deliker preached to us that he had all power in the world to call all the angels in the world to face the soldiers that were coming to get him. In a word, he could have just spoken and they would have dissolved like snow before him in the summer sun. But he chose to take the whipping. He chose to take the mocking. He chose to take the spitting because he was putting you first. He had you in mind when he was going to the cross. He was hated. He was not just hailed as the king of the Jews, but when they led him to Golgotha, which was the place of a skull, they were to quarry outside of, of Jerusalem, probably the place of a skull didn't have clean lines in it so they could cut rock and build buildings with it. So they just left it like a little knob, and so it was bare on top. And the Romans found it a very convenient place to crucify people. It would have been a very public place. It would have been lifted high so other people could see. It's not like a massive hill. It's just a little 
piece of ground that's higher than the other ground, probably near the road that entered into Jerusalem so that there were passerbyers. And the scripture says that the passerbyers came by and wagged their heads and shook their heads and put him down. I mean, surely, surely he must have done something wrong to get crucified. I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Bad things don't happen to good people, right? But here's the Lord of glory, the best of us all, having the worst done to him. And so the passerbyers who would have been going in and out of Jerusalem that day, a very busy day because the next day was the Passover feast, they would have assuredly said, He must have done something wrong. He must be guilty. You ever had this attitude towards someone else? When they're going through a trial, you thought they were a good person, but since they're going through the trial, you know there's something wrong. Like Job's friends. And then the priests, of all people, the people that, who, who should have known the word of God, the people that studied the word of God, the people that were, that were immersed in the word of God, stood there. And with the scribes, mocked him, saying, you saved others, save yourself. You know, Jesus said, and if you have a Bible, I invite you to go back to chapter 8 and verse 34. This is after he told his disciples that he was going to be crucified and Peter rebuked him for it. And then he set Peter right. He crawled the crowd with him together with his disciples, and he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. There is Jesus being taunted by the evil one on the cross with his own words. Whoever would save his life will lose it. And Jesus has the power to save his life. And yet he commits his entire life into the Father's hand. For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will a son of man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father, and with his holy angels. And there Jesus is hanging on the cross, being taunted by his own words. Come down, and we will believe. For those of you who are philosophers and who have studied philosophy and history, it was Thomas Aquinas who said, I know that I might believe. That statement set the foundation for the um, Renaissance and the Enlightenment where science became king and took the place of faith in our lives. Do you hear what the priests are saying? You come down, and if we see it, then we will believe. Beloved, the preaching of the word of God is always this. We have faith that we might know. You may love Josh McDowell. He wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. You may be sitting here today going, show me more, show me more power, show me more glory, show me more miracle, and then I will believe. Beloved, Bible says God is good. Put your faith in him, and then you can. In other words, you can't look at the water and decide whether or not it's cold or hot and not want to jump in. You, by faith, have to enter if you want to know God. We preach Christ crucified as the answer to all of mankind's deepest needs and the answer to all of mankind's greatest desires. But if you're still waiting for evidence from that, 
it is not going to come to you. Christ was crucified, Christ was buried, Christ was raised from the uh, dead. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is good. Put your faith in that, and then you will know. And here we have, centuries before Aquinas, Aquinas was about 1,000 A.D., but Aquinas said, give me the facts, give me the evidence that demands a verdict, and then I will believe. And so we have everybody running around talking about the Bible like it's a science book. Where in science is there a resurrection from the dead? Where in science is there an ocean that opens up and God's people walk through it? Where in science is there a man who walks on water and says to the storm, be still and it's still? You will never get scientific evidence for that. By faith, you must believe. And what's calling you to believe is God's humility. And then just to put the little cherry on the, on the Sunday, Satan has the two criminals that are on his side mock him as they are being crucified. And they're terrorists. They're murderers. The man whose place that Jesus Barabbas was a murderer. They're not thieves. That's a, that's a bad translation. Although I'm sure they would have stolen from you if they could. They were violent, wicked men. And Jesus was put in the middle like he was the leader. of them. The humiliation couldn't have been worse. And he's hated. And it's hard to understand that. Because what had he done to provoke anyone other than say, you need me? It's, it's, it's probably the most offensive thing that God says. You need me. You can't do this on your own. You will never be good enough. There's no work of righteousness that you could do to restore this relationship. This is the what of the humiliation. So let's talk about the why of it. Why is all this going on? Because this is the penalty necessary to be paid for our salvation. So when he cries out on the Christ, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, it's really interesting to me that the gospel writer puts it in Aramaic. If you've ever visited an old person in a nursing home who during their lifetime learned to speak two or three languages, they will speak to you in the hour of their greatest turmoil as death is coming upon them in their mother tongue, the language that they learned when they were a child. I used to visit a nursing home in Texas and there was a woman there that could only speak to me in German. She had spoken several languages during her lifetime, but as she was approaching death, she could only speak in German. And so I I remember her being so frustrated with me because I couldn't understand a word she was saying. I couldn't put her sentences together. So all I would do is hold her hand and listen to her speak and speak and speak and try to get something out of me and I would just smile and say, God loves you. Christ loves you. God is here with you. That's all I could say and I hope that somehow the Holy Spirit could translate my presence into an understanding in her heart that God was with her and that God loved her. And every time I walked by, she would reach her hand out. She she wasn't someone that I knew. She was just there when I went to visit someone I knew. But when she saw me, she would reach her hand out and want me to sit with her so she could talk to me. And here we have our Savior crying out in his mother tongue. It wasn't Hebrew, it was Aramaic. Aramaic is what the Jews spoke in Palestine at the time. So Jesus certainly spoke Hebrew, he probably spoke Latin and Greek also. He 
would have, if he grew up in Nazareth, be able to interact with all those cultures. But here's the more guttural thing about this. It's not Aramaic that was his original language. It's prayer. Prayer is his mother tongue. Prayer is how Jesus uses words. Talking to his Father in heaven is his basic core heart idea. And that's why he says, my God, my God. See, this is covenantal language, beloved. God said in the Old Testament, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And our response to that is, you are our God, or as an individual, you are my God, and I am your person. It's kind of like the interaction that went on between you and us, or you all and me, when you installed me. You are our pastor, and, and you are my people. Now, that's just a formalization of a church relationship. I want to be here as a friend. I want to be here as a brother. I want to be here as a family member. So Jesus is not just using covenantal language like it's some formal contract between him and his God. It's like, you're all I have. You're my God. This simple statement explains so much of what was happening on the cross because Jesus never turned away from God. And you can think of it this way, God took Jesus in his hand, the Father, and threw him into outer darkness and watched him fall and descend and go and drop. And the whole time that Jesus was following, falling, he was looking in the heavens with his eyes, trying to catch a vision of the Father and crying out, why are you forsaking me? And this is a difficult statement to understand because he's God, very God, and he knows all things. But he's like you and I in that he's a human. And have you ever suffered and wondered why God was forsaking you? He wasn't forsaking you. He was forsaking this one. So you would never be forsaken. Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. When, when I have you going out and making disciples, my name is, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus says at the end, Matthew, Gospel, lo, I am with you to the end of the age. He, he sent the Holy Spirit to seal you into the day of redemption. God's Spirit is on you and with you at all times, you have never been forsaken like this. But what's happening is, is we're understanding that the Father, and it would have been suffering for the Father also to forsake the Son, as much as it would be for the Son to endure the cross and be forsaken himself. Why have you forsaken me? Because he's dying in your place because he thought of you first. And this is true humility. True humility is when the person dying for you is so great. You're not looking to one of the thieves and the robbers and the terrorists on either side of Jesus' death to be your substitute, are you? And that was a just penalty. They were violent men. But Christ, his death was special. Not because he was weak, because he was strong. Not because he was a no count, it's because he counted for everything. Not because he was impure, because he was pure. He was holy, he was righteous, he was good. That what 
makes this death so glorious and so tragic in the same breath. This is why he's dying. And and what we need to extract out of this is if we want relationships to be restored, we have to be humble also. There's no relationship restored unless we humble ourselves in the spaces where the relationships have been broken. You know, my my son listens to my sermons. My wife, obviously, listens to my sermons. It's always been difficult for me to say things here and then go in my house if I lived inconsistently. I, I haven't always been the best husband. I haven't always been the best father. My answer to my children and my wife and those who know me the best cannot be, well, suck it up. No one likes a pastor whose marriage has fallen apart, and no one likes a pastor who's distant from his children. So you guys just bear the load, because this is what puts food on the table. That work? That over a long period of time work? No, when I do wrong, I have to go to my wife and say, sorry, I was wrong. Would you forgive me? I have to humble myself. In my parenting, when I thought I was doing a great job and I blew it, I had to go to my children and say, I'm sorry. I was wrong, I blew it. If if one of my children who listened to this sermon online called me today and said, Dad, there's still an issue between us. Let's make it right. I would answer that call. Remember one time when I was teaching in, in a Christian school, a bunch of sixth graders, and they were always, they were sixth graders. They were doing sixth grade things. And I got angry and I kind of yelled at them for doing sixth grade things. But my response was way overblown. Remember the Spirit of God telling me that evening, don't go back and teach them sixth graders before you apologize to them. I won't bless any of your teaching if you don't go and apologize to them. Remember the next day I got the class together and they were all like terrified that I was going to like pull some of their fingernails out or poke one of their eyes. And I said, look, guys, I'm sorry. I should be Christ in front of you. And I blew it. I was angry. And kind of what I was expecting was them to say, oh, Mr. Newton, we love you. We forgive you and move on. You know what their, you know what their response was? Shock. They had never seen an adult apologize to a child. The adults were always right, and kids were always wrong. But I was wrong, and they were were closer to right than I was. (laughs) (laughs) But beloved, you can never restore a relationship, even if you're 20% wrong and the other person's 80% wrong, by saying, I was less wrong than you. You have to own your wrongness 100%. Because our Savior who was not wrong at all, owned all of our wrongness. He owned all of our wrongness so he could make us righteous in him. So I'm going to talk about kind of what it looks like if you're truly humble. People who are truly humble retain relationships. They don't have a series of broken relationships in their past. People who are humble put others first. We've already talked about this. People who are humble listen. People who are humble are curious. Ironically, people who are humble speak their minds. They're not like some retreating wallflower. Humble people know how to say thank you. There's a story about 
Winston Churchill, who I believe was a great man, but he had flaws. But Winston Churchill one day offended one of his servants. And to make the relationship right, Winston Churchill had to apologize to one of his servants. After he did so, uttering, uttering his breath, he said, but I'm a great man. Like, because I'm a great man, I don't have to stoop down to you and apologize. But Christ, who did not consider his equality with God to be anything to be grasped, humbled himself to the point of being a servant and even unto death, and that a death on a cross, that he might have the name above every other name. So true humility is knowing who you are and at the same time being able to say, thank you, I appreciate you, I lift you up, I encourage you, I love you, I care for you. Humble people assume responsibility. Humble people accept feedback, whether it's positive or negative, and they do it graciously. Humble people ask for help. It's like, I need you. You know the number one unspoken value of the American middle class is independence? I don't need you. I can do this on my own. I'm pretty sharp myself. I'm wise. I know how to navigate these waters. You leave me alone. If I really need help, maybe then I'll call. Beloved, how do I get your spiritual gifts to work together? Because the Bible says that you are absolutely dependent on the person sitting next to you, spiritual gifts to grow. Absolutely 100% dependent. I can't grow apart from you. I need you. Desperately. Like I need water. Like I need food after days if not eating. Like I need sleep when I'm totally exhausted. That's how I need you. I can't have Christ apart from you. And you can't have Christ apart from one another. It is so hard for us to admit that. To say that is to say I don't want Christ because this is the way he operates. It's interesting that the Roman who looked at him said truly this was the son of God because Jesus uttered with a loud cry just before he died. One commentator said the breath coming from his lungs was so strong that it created a wind that ripped the veil in the temple from top to bottom. Now that's fanciful thinking. We know the veil ripped from top to bottom to allow us access into the inner sanctum of God, but that breath of Jesus kind of creatively, poetically imagined, opening up the pathway for you to come in. And you know what? One last mocking. Hey, let's see, he's calling Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes. They're mocking him for thinking that he was the Messiah because everybody knew that Elijah would come prior to the Messiah. And so they're standing there watching him die going, huh, we'll see if Elijah comes. Let's see if Elijah comes. They're saying that to Jesus, not to satisfy their own curiosity. They're mocking Jesus going, Elijah's not here, pal. You're not the Messiah. So even as he's uttering his last breath of trust and covenantal loyalty to God and knowing that God is loving and wondering why this is all happening to him, there's a voice in his ear going, you're a loser, pal. You've lost the battle. It's not you. And yet, because he's not thinking of himself and he's thinking of you, he endures it to the end. And then Joseph of Arimathea, with courage, goes to Pilate and asks if he could have his body. And Pilate goes, what? He's dead already? Because it took a long time to die. So he couldn't take Joseph of Arimathea's word for it, so he sends the centurion. He sends for the centurion, and he says, did he die? So the same centurion who said, truly this was the son of God, 
came back and reported to Pilate and said, yeah, he's dead. And so then he could have the body granted to Joseph of Arimathea. But see, this, this Roman soldier expresses in great understanding that this was the Son of God because he had probably watched scores of men die on a cross. It was his job to kill people on crosses. And people on crosses always died pretty much the same way unconsciously suffocating to death. And this is exactly the opposite. Every Roman reader, every Roman who was sitting there had probably watched someone crucified and knew that they died without a voice, unconscious. And yet our God in the last moments utters a loud cry and gives up his own breath, which meant he was in control 100% of the time, while he was being humiliated, while he was being hated, he was thinking of us. This is why he didn't take the wine mixed with myrrh, because that's a drug. So Joseph of Arimathea shrouds him. The women, it says here, watch so they can go back and take care of the responsibility, and they put him in a tomb. The one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, lay dead in a tomb. So there's a couple of suggestions I have for you as we finish. Some stuff that you may need to shroud and bury with Christ. Because he paid for the sin. He paid for the distance. He paid for the darkness. He paid for the chaos. He paid for your turmoil. He paid for your hatred. He paid for your lack of forgiveness. Got a lot of great people here. I'm just going to ask the open question, not accusing anyone. Is there estrangement between you and your children? And does that estrangement have anything to do with your love of Jesus? Are they rebellious and running away? I, I'm asking you to go through your life and ask yourself this question. Was I the kind of parent that lived out the grace and the love and the mercy and the goodness of God in front of my children in such a way that would make them attractive to want to know Christ? Because if they don't, maybe it's on you in part. And what Christ is asking you to do, what I'm asking you to do as pastor, but you can dismiss that because I'm just a guy who's going to be here for a decade or so. Christ will be here eternally. What he's asking you to do is humble yourself and go and make amends. Not wait for them, not wait for Christmas and hope that they come and hear Pastor Stan and his awesome sermons. Wait for them to open their Bible. Wait for them to answer that text. Wait for them for you to send them that YouTube video that really moved you. No, Christianity is about relationship. You go and you humble yourself And the strength that you have to do it is because your Savior did it for you. It's what our God does. It's his most desirous quality that he would do this for us because there is no salvation apart from this. And there is no restoration of that relationship with your children or your sister or your brother or your former spouse or somebody else in your neighborhood if you don't go humble yourself. There is none. This is why there'll be no peace in Israel. Because Israel will refuse to humble itself before Hamas, and Hamas, you know, won't humble themselves before Israel. They're going to keep their weapons leveled. And as long as weapons are leveled, we'll just keep killing each other. Is there a lie that you need to keep telling to preserve your self-image? Is there a story or a narrative that you keep telling? And it's like, if you actually told people the truth, then you would look less in their eyes. You need to wrap that in linen cloth and bury it with Jesus and just tell the truth. When I was a young man, I used to tell lies all the time because I felt insignificant. So I'd 
my older brother was always just bigger, stronger, and faster. And for those of you who have met my older brother who helped drive me here, you can tell he's bigger, stronger, faster, smarter than me. I was always silver medal to my brother, so I'd always tell these stories to make myself look better. And then after I became a Christian, and I was the only Christian in my family, they would say, hey, tell us the story of when you... And it's like, that was a lie. I can't tell that story anymore. Then just started telling the truth, and they were like, those stories aren't interesting anymore. <laughs> but at least my heart felt clean. Is there a kind of person you don't like? Okay, so the answer to that's yes. I'm asking you to think about the kind of person you don't like, and are you willing to humble yourself before that person so that you maybe can get to like them? So maybe there could be a relationship person you could reach out to. Those are just a few examples of what it means that our God humbled himself and went to a cross. Beloved, there is no new creation in which all this stuff is dealt with. It's bad theology to go, I believed in Jesus as Savior, I'm just waiting for him to return. Your proclamation, your announcement, your belief, your understanding of the gospel of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is that you do what he did because he will empower you to do it. Uh, This is what we say. I can't do this on my own, Lord. I've got this monstrous pride that I can't swallow. I've got this vivid memory of what they have done wrong. I'm pretty good. I can't believe that you're asking me to go and stand before somebody and admit my error. Well, since we can't do that, we have to rely on the strength of God to do it. Your proclamation of the uh, resurrection of our Savior from the dead is your action when you go and do that. Father in heaven, I shudder to the core thinking that I will walk into situations where I know I have been wrong when I want to blame the other person for it being their fault, thinking that I would have to humble myself to restore that relationship. Father, you have given it to us as ambassadors for your kingdom to restore relationships. And I pray that you would give us the strength by the power of your Holy Spirit to look on the Savior who died for us and recognize but that's how he brought us back to him. We thank you that we are yours and we can say you are my God and we can pray that in Jesus' name, amen. You please stand.